it's important to think about private equity in Africa not necessarily by looking at where is it today in absolute terms, but rather what is the trajectory and where is the private equity, uh, where is the whole industry moving to? If you, markets change much, much faster than perceptions. Perceptions take a while to catch up, and markets can really change quickly. And I think about the work that I've done uh, even before Africa. Um, I was living in Hong Kong and in China in the early 1990s and worked there um, for Goldman Sachs at the time. And there was no private property. There was no concept of private property in China. There was no courthouse where you could file a title. There wasn't a law firm that could opine on whether you were doing the whole thing right. There was no way to really move markets. It was entirely controlled by, by the state. That was in the early 1990s. Not really a whiff of entrepreneurism in, in China, and that's within living memory. And now China, of course, huge engine of growth for, for the entire world. And, and, and a very successful example, not only of pulling you know, tens of millions of people out of poverty, but also, and because the, uh, of being able to really hand over the engine of growth, you know, make the private sector the engine of growth, allow the private sector to perform within their political context. But I can even take a, an example and bring it even closer. Okay. In, in 2000, um, India, almost no incoming investment into, into India, a billion people. Um, and really what set off the India, you know, sort of trajectory, the momentum, was something that had very little to do with India. It was, it was Y2K. It was this idea that corporations in Europe and in the United States had sort of fumbled this, uh, you know, turn of the century thing. Everything would be set back. As a result, January 1st, 2000, the traffic lights wouldn't work. You know, everybody filled their bathtub up the night before in case the water didn't work that morning, and you know, just this scare. But it, preceding that was this push to outsource and to really fix this this sort of awkward um, and difficult uh, software program uh, pr uh, problem. And India had capacity, and 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 here, you know, after almost 50 years or so of really socialism, of state control of everything, of a Raj economy of this notion that the government would pick the winners. And so if, if, uh, if you made the, the right kind of um, you know, political contribution to the Congress party or whatever, uh, then you could make cable. And you didn't have to compete in the world because India only bought Indian cable from one guy, you, you know, who made the, uh, you know, who sort of worked the system. And that whole sort of Raj economy has now been mostly dismantled as, um, as the, the, set, you know, the, the, the engine of growth, again, was handed over to the private sector. Now, when you look at that huge demonstration effect, I mean, it actually worked. And again, tens, if not hundreds of millions of people pulled out of poverty. And, and so you look at Africa, um, very much within living memory, you know, really very little private equity before, before 2000. And, and again, as I say, in, around the world, very formative still. You know, while, while Africa was, while we were developing our first fund in what became ECP, you know, India was still trying to figure out, you, you know, um, how, how to make itself attractive. Um, you know, the, again, 10 years ago in India, you, could, you know, you couldn't open a McDonald's. You could not open a McDonald's. Yeah. Suzanne was telling me she was, uh, used to work at McDonald's Corporation, right? The, the fast food, yeah. So, um, you know, the idea of, of having, um, of having uh, foreigners, you know, involved in the economy was really kind of almost repulsive in India. Ten years ago, when I went to India, you know, when I, when I used to go to India in the 1990s, you'd drive in from the airport, and there, would, the, the, there were billboards for cement. I mean, that was... Or, or industrial fasteners. And you could see it so quickly change to blue jeans and cell phones as the government just stepped back 
and allowed certain areas and then more and more areas of the economy to be driven by the private sector. And so this demonstration effect, to me, it is so clear that, um, that it's what's pushing Africa into these very, very successful uh, uh, rates of economic growth from a low base, but really leading the world in economic growth. And you know, the, the, I think the key ingredient here is the recognition that, that was not prevailing before, say, 10 years ago, that the uh, private sector as the engine of growth actually creates political stability as opposed to threaten political stability. So suddenly, across Africa, Kenya, Ghana, um, you know, I mean, you name the country, the debate, and you, you can still name a few countries where the debate is not happening, like Zimbabwe, but across most of Africa, you, you know, you'll have the, the, the incumbent, the party in power, and then you'll have the challenging party. Nobody on either side is saying, let's roll back those reforms. You know, we went too far too fast. You rarely hear that. Mm -hmm. Because what people, both, both the, incum the incumbents are saying let's do more and the, and, the, and the challenging party or parties are saying let's do more. So, so, you know, I think the leading indicators, and you see them with, you know, better successions, more democracies, um, um, fewer conflicts, you, you see them sort of play out in a very significant way um, and, then you, and then you see, you know, sort of the, the hints of what's to come, particularly driven by a more robust uh, middle class um, uh, and, and all of the uh, efficiencies that can occur when you have a middle class, um, efficiencies that are driven by cell phones, um, efficiencies that are driven by internet connections, efficiencies that are driven by uh, intermodal, you know, sort of, sort of, um, uh, you know, almost postmodern uh, uh, lo logistics and, and intermodal uh, uh, um, uh, possibilities to increase efficiencies associated with just moving things around, just in time inventory, um, you know, refrigerated goods. I mean, people from here. Uh, you know, watch 747s leave their country every day with flowers going to Holland. Um, you, you know, something that, that the infrastructure and, 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 and just the possibilities didn't exist when we were starting our business. So um, uh, uh, another very, very significant uh, um, development is uh, the, 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 the really the transition from north-south trade and linkages to south-south trade. So as you go from sort of a very, uh, you know, historical uh, perspective on, on trade with Europe um, and, 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 and how that's structured and where it's going. And, and you open up Taiwan, you open up Singapore, you open up China, you open up Thailand, and you open up all of uh, everything involved in, uh, you know, when you bring um, uh, lamb from New Zealand, you don't want to uh, uh, bring your, your uh, your reefer into the uh, into the Mediterranean. You need to have uh, port facilities on the on the east side before you get to the Suez Canal, and and that's a you know that kind of precipitating and evolving understanding of how to support the way the world is changing is having a profound impact on Africa and having a profound impact on on uh, investment in Africa. And so, you know, for people in our space, in the private equity space, it's not, it, you know, to me, it doesn't seem, it's, it's not like you need a bunch of geniuses figuring it out. It, you, you just look, you know, you look at what happened in Brazil, you look at what happened in, in Thailand, and you say, how can this not happen in Africa? Well, you know, Africa can be difficult. I mean, you know, the most, the most difficult thing about Africa, I, I think in some ways, is that there are just too many countries. Um, you know, and we can even argue about how, you know, are there 53, are there 54? Anyway, I'm always interested in that, how people can, can <laughs> never quite agree. How many did the African Development Bank say? 54? That's we, too politically countries? loaded now, so okay. I have an answer. <laughs> so, uh, so from a private equity perspective, um, the model that the large, successful, 
private equity firms developed doesn't really fit in Africa. Uh, private equity firms have partnerships, and they're, you know, so you have a few guys who, you know, a few men and women who are trying to decide most things. Um, and that works if you're, if, if you're focused on Asia and you're focused on maybe three really big countries, or if you're focused on the United States, or if you're f focused in Europe. If you're focused in Africa, you've got 54 countries to cover, and, um, and, and, and not very many mega deals. And that has, that, that has delayed the development of, um, of private equity um, as an asset class um, versus the way that it's rolled out in the rest of the world. It, has, it, it feels more like venture capital sometimes than it does established private equity. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't make it a bad business. It just, it just, it just informs you on how you have to structure your, your resources um, and, and, how to, and how to be active on the ground. These are not insurmountable problems. I'm just, again, trying to suggest that the, the trajectory is pretty wonderful in Africa, but there are reasons why you know, it, it has lagged. Um, but I think that those are the same reasons why investors today need to think about how to get ahead of the curve, ahead of the fire, and be, uh, and be active in, in Africa. Doing business in Africa. You can't afford to be without Africa Investor.